This is not a good news story. This is a glimpse into one of humanity's darkest sides, in which vulnerable people, some as young as 10 years old, are lured away from their homes, taken against their will, moved across towns, cities or countries to be exploited by others. Trafficking in humans for sex or labor is supported by a global network of criminals, and the scale of the problem is such that combating this forms part of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, end modern slavery and human trafficking. It's a fight that's been taken on by many, and while the crime persists and is in some cases becoming more widespread, there are stories of hope. Welcome to Future Impact, an investec focus radio podcast series that brings you stories of people and organizations contributing to solving South Africa's most pressing sustainability challenges. In this episode, we're uncovering some insights into human trafficking, the abduction of individuals whose subsequent abuse by others includes sex, forced labor, child soldiers, and more. We speak to activists and legal experts about how trafficking happens and the current state of the crime in South Africa. We also hear from Investex Avina Gajda about the institution's role in combating human trafficking. My name is Seben Zilingambule, and this is Investec Future Impact, Episode 6. We begin with a voice from the front line. My name is Luke Lamprecht and I'm the Head of Advocacy for Women and Men Against Child Abuse. Women and Men Against Child Abuse is an NGO that, in their own words, is there to catch vulnerable people who fall through the cracks. Luke outlines some of the ways in which people from South Africa, the African continent and around the world become victims of trafficking. In the early 2000s, what we were seeing is young people being brought to the city, often under false pretenses. For example, they would be brought from the Eastern Cape, from the Free State. And interestingly, in, in quite a few instances, women recruiting young people and saying, come to Joburg, we can get you work. But when they arrive in Joburg, they are made to work in the sex industry. Because we're an organization focusing on sexual abuse, we saw a lot of young people who were being really just pimped and prostituted out. And once in the system, it was very difficult for them to get out. There was issues of substance abuse, issues of not being able to move. They told their families they were here, for example, to do admin jobs, and they now couldn't go home. A lot to do with poverty and the internal migration. In Luke's experience, there are some especially tragic cases. I remember the one young woman I spoke to, she had a baby. She needed the baby to be cared for. She couldn't get a grant. The father of the child had abandoned them, so she had no income. She left the child with her mother and was coming to work in Joburg. So this is about 20 years ago. And, I mean, they were charging 20 rand for sex and renting out the parking bays in the office complexes in town. The security guards would rent them out to have sex in the cars. And she was sending them 200 rand a month. So, you know, the idea that these people are coming for huge money is not correct. And in that case, the pimps that were pimping her out also were not these extremely wealthy kind of cartel-like people. While a lot of what gets reported on when it comes to trafficking is linked to sexual exploitation, it's important to note that there are other areas in which trafficking has its tentacles, tentacles that span the globe. We got stuff from inter Africa, Swaziland, Lesotho, over our local border, Zimbabwe, a little bit of Mozambique. We had young people brought in over those borders. Interestingly, a lot of that was for labor. There was this idea that you bring in young people over the border to get opportunities, but you kind of bypass in labor law and you're kind of keeping them kind of as slave like labor. One instance, which is an international trafficking case run by a Brazilian guy, a whole lot of very wealthy South Africans involved. We're in the northern suburbs where a group of Thai girls were brought over by a group of South African and Brazilian men and kept in a mansion here in Bryanston. 
and they actually held their passports and then they would sort of rent them out to the various strip clubs and brothels etc in the Santon and Joburg area and then when we went in and tried to assist the girls to leave they would phone various men who would come and say no no we've brought the girls over here they are wives we're just waiting for their papers so that they would say okay well these girls are here because they're here to be married. And interestingly, those girls weren't here under total false pretenses. They knew they were coming here for some kind of sexual transaction. But when they were here, they couldn't leave because they were in debt and also because they no longer had their own passports. Like being linked solely to sex work, another common misconception exists about trafficking, that it necessarily involves movement between one area, usually distant, and another. My name is Marcel van der Waard and I'm a senior research analyst with the National Centre on Sexual Exploitation. And I'm also a research fellow at the Centre for Human Rights, the University of the Free State. Marcel clarifies some misnomers about trafficking with a frightening example of how insidious the crime can be. So the first thing, importantly, is that movement is not a prerequisite for trafficking. You can actually have trafficking happening literally in one street and in one neighborhood. There's an example of a Nigerian pimp who literally took his victim to see a mom at a wimpy every other week. Now, that's also counterintuitive because that's where control mechanisms comes in, you know, like trauma bonding. After this meeting and the coffee with the mom, the victim was taken back to being exploited by this guy in the sex trade. So I think that's the important part. It's, it's a very, very complex, nuanced crime. And it gets more complex when trying to ascertain just how widespread the problem is. Marcel explains. Well, it really depends on who you're speaking to, because we've got research and researchers that claim trafficking is hardly a problem and that the issue is rarely encountered and that sex trafficking and child trafficking is a myth. But as soon as you go into the study and you look at the the methodology and how the definition was employed in this research, you realize that it's hugely, hugely problematic. And this also leads to victims of trafficking being undercounted in research because the definition is employed incorrectly and truncated. And we also see this very prominent theme in research between the philosophy that trafficking Trafficking is not a problem. And in the same paper, the same researchers would claim and call for a, a fully decriminalized or a legalized sex trade and or the desecuritization of migration. So there are other philosophical issues that comes into play, obfuscates evidence, and it really creates this confusion about what human trafficking is. Perhaps a little more clear are the questions of who's in charge of trafficking operations and how they work. When it comes to the first question, it's probably not who you think. When we talk about organized crime and syndicates, what we are seeing in human trafficking really is loosely connected networks. And this whole idea of a syndicate prompted by the idea of the Cosa Nostra in the 1940s, we had this very bad guy on top and all the lieutenants beneath him. You know, that's really how it happens. Today, I use you for a purpose and tomorrow I don't. So there's these relationships of convenience that traffickers sometimes employ. And that's why these syndicates are loosely connected and and effective because they are so fluid. And obviously corruption plays a massive role and enables and perpetuates this crime. According to Luke, there's another group that doesn't fit the classic criminal profile. These are extremely wealthy people running kind of sex rings and almost trading in children for sex. I think the most recent case to think about was the movement of boys across provinces by a very prominent senior council advocate. That's the facade because you create a facade to give you access. Those are called career offenders. They choose jobs that give them access to vulnerable children. The second question, the how, has an unsurprising answer. Traffickers leverage the near-ubiquitous access and reach that technology brings to find and ensnare victims. 
technology entirely anonymizes traffickers and it's such a useful tool from a trafficking perspective to create this facade of an opportunity for possible victims to engage with. Frequently, they cannot be checked or verified. So technology is a fundamental part of the infrastructure created by and used by traffickers. I've done work in Cape Town where I've uh, sat and had a beer with this one Nigerian uh, trafficker and, and obviously didn't know who I was, but it was literally showing me that he's busy building a relationship with what he claimed to be more than 70 women and using, amongst others, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, and the direct messaging functionalities of these platforms. So what was really interesting at the time was like each one of these profiles that he created was very sophisticated and he morphed between all of them. He's got his own profile, but he also created a profile of a mom a father, a brother, all with their own unique profiles and avatars, yet they are all the same person. So when you have a possible victim or a person being recruited that needs to check or verify who a person or his associates or affiliates are, they simply try and check in with the brother profile or the employer or somebody in the network and those are all fake profiles. So there's no way that they can actually verify any of that. So it's an entire infrastructure that these guys create and they build with technology. And that's just one of many examples of how they actually use technology to perpetrate the crime of trafficking. It's easy to look at trafficking as something that happens to other less fortunate people. But as Marcel explains, the crime can also have financial and geopolitical impact. What is important to understand also is that so much money is leaving the country in hard cash. Smuggling cum trafficking networks that brings nationalities into South Africa from Somalia and a host of other countries. We know some of these with actual links to extremist groups and the amount that they pay per person ranges anything from 6,000 to 8,000 US dollars. One example an informant shared with me like every weekend at least 45 men entering from a small village in Mozambique being transported into South Africa to the Valcom area for illegal mining purposes and they do fit the definition of trafficking victims. For any victim of trafficking, the best outcome would be an extraction from their captors and a return to a normal life. As Luke explains though, victim support isn't at the level it should be, both in South Africa and internationally. Well, that is severely, severely lacking. The things that place them at risk for this kind of abuse and exploitation is in itself a problem. The abuse and exploitation is a traumatic problem in its own right. Then the fact that they have to go home having told their families at home that they gain for whatever reasons and come back and they have now been trafficked, you've got to provide support at the country of origin. And often the reason they leave those countries is that there's not sufficient support. Luke was involved in a sex tourism case that took place in a hotel located in Santon, a South African municipality also known as Africa's richest square mile. A European man was paying for sex with young boys from an impoverished area near his hotel. And although there was a successful arrest, the support for the victims was far more challenging. The witnesses who are very vulnerable, for example, are on drugs, have mental health problems, who are quite migrant, all of the things that make them vulnerable make them complicated witnesses at the same time. So we had a huge complication supporting those young men to give evidence against the person who had paid them as a sex tourist. There's support for them emotionally, there's the support through the legal process, there's support in terms of the fact that uh, where do you stay in South Africa? There are no facilities for that. It is immensely under-resourced on every level. So it's not victim-centric. For Luke, another failure in the system is something that looks like the right solution for victims initially, but actually harms the fight against trafficking in the long run. Referring to the case of the Thai woman he mentioned at the start of the episode, he illustrates an important point. 
There's an international organization that assists with basically taking people home and providing support at the country of origin. The Thailand example I used, when we found the young girls, their entry into the country was now no longer considered legal. They needed to be moved home. And the organization that moved them home and ensured their support back in the country of origin, they would prioritize getting those young people home, which is correct. What that does, unfortunately, is it removes the witnesses in the cases to prosecute the people involved in the trafficking. There's a level at which we always have to remember that the best interests of all people who are harmed come first. And we need to look after them. It's about, you know, getting the sex buyers and it's about getting the traffickers or the people who are, you know, facilitating the trafficking. But when it comes to supporting the victim, the president says in his multiple family meetings, you know, we, we place victims at the center of our system. They most certainly are not. For Marcel, there's a critical group of people whose voices are an important part of eradicating trafficking, but who are being ignored. Unfortunately, the voices of sex trade survivors are almost entirely ignored in ongoing conversations about whether the sex trade should be decriminalized or not. The voices of sex trafficking victims are also ignored. And other voices being ignored in this conversation are those of practitioners, those actually doing the work and seeing these phenomena at a granular level, police investigators, prosecutors that take these cases to court. Marcel explains how there's a large part of the problem that's not being addressed, the demand. However, it's only one part of a complex set of problems that need to be addressed. South Africa has international obligations to prosecute traffickers, to prevent the crime of trafficking and to assist and to protect victims of trafficking. And one of the key things is we need to suppress consumer level demand. And I'm referring you to consumer level demand for commercial sex and forced labor. And South Africa is really doing little to none to address the issue of sex buying. And we've got very clear, well delineated laws that criminalize sex buying. And there's very good reasons for that. We know that traffickers pocket the money and that sex buyers are paying the money. And thousands and thousands of sex buyers who simply pay and exploit and abuse women and children in the sex trade and simply get away with that. And I think the root to this is the issue of behavior and entitlement that you can actually buy someone else as a commodity that you can simply pay for sex, not even knowing or caring what the state of agency is and what control mechanisms are implicit or exerted by a third party. The other issue is the issue of corruption and actually holding accountable officials who are complicit in trafficking. And there's many examples uh, stemming from successfully prosecuted cases where traffickers have actually been sent to jail, where we see police and immigration officials that's never been held accountable, and where they themselves use and exploit women and children in the sex trade or other forms of criminal behavior with undocumented immigrants in South Africa. If only there was a one-size-fits-all solution to this problem. But, but what we do know is that we need to hold people accountable that consume these exploitative services. And we also need to look after victims and, and survivors of trafficking through the entire life cycle of justice and reintegration. If you're enjoying this podcast, look out for our other episodes in which we explore more about sustainability and responsible investing and discover how the future of investment is already having real-world impact. Subscribe to Investec Focus Radio Essay wherever you get your podcasts. And please take a moment to rate the podcast. It helps to ensure that like-minded listeners can also discover this content. The subject of human trafficking is a dark one to begin with, and given the difficulties of tackling the problem within the South African context, it would be easy to think that it's a battle that's being lost. But with activists like Luke and Marcel on the ground, there are inroads being made and victories being won. And it's not just individuals and NGOs who are taking on the difficult task of countering the heinous industry corporates are adding their energy and initiatives to the fight. 
I am Avina Gajadar. I'm at Investec in the Financial Crime Compliance Team. In December 2019, the South African Anti-Money Laundering Integrated Task Force was launched with the aim of preventing, detecting and disrupting financial crimes. Avina explains how Investec is involved with the country's first public-private partnership between the banking sector and the government regulatory authorities and the role it plays in combating trafficking. It is important as a financial institution that we are engaged and we are aware and we try and drive where we can stop human trafficking, slave labor, etc. We are looking at trying to understand and determine the financial flows and where we can predetermine and understand where there is some form of trafficking taking place. So something called an STR, Suspicious Transaction Report, together with the Financial uh, Intelligence Centre. We've looked at these STRs that have been previously reported where we see key words or key phrases that would identify um, that trafficking has happened between these financial flows. And I think it's very important as a financial institution collectively, so it's, it's, it's across the financial institutions, that we come together, um, share this information as well to see how we can, again, predetermine, identify and stop this. And again, bringing together those typologies from our cross-border parties and you know, um, ensuring that we identify and we notice where those financial flows are and how we can learn from our partners as well and bring into our country an influence in trying to stop this. The banking sector's armory doesn't simply extend to identifying potential perpetrators. They're also offering support to victims. Through research, we've found that the victims, they go back to their captors because of the lack of financial stability that they have. And what we found is that, and again, this is just one of the initiatives from the expert working group, is that we've got accounts in South Africa. We've got basic accounts that we can issue to victims where we play the role with the with the NGOs as well to be, you know, as part of those accounts so that it, it's, it's given to the victim, it's in the victim's name. And where the NGO is able to find the victim work, they can be paid through that account. They get that financial freedom, they get that financial stability, and then there's no need to go back to the captor. There's no need to go back to the initial situation that they found themselves in. Obviously, your passport gets taken away, your identification documents get taken away, and these are things from a regulatory perspective that is needed when you open up a bank account. What we're trying to do is work together with the other financial institutions, work together with the regulators to not necessarily break the law in terms of opening up an account, but trying to see how we can open up an account for a victim so they don't fall back into the original situation that they were in. And despite the subject matter, Avina says the work being done by Investec and their partners is not only fulfilling, but is also starting to show signs of hope. It's been a joy in these expert working groups to see the different financial institutions come together and share the information and share the knowledge. We meet on a weekly basis and it's not something that we're going to fix immediately. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, from a data mining perspective, there are thousands of STRs that were looked at. There's approximately a hundred keywords and key phrases that we've identified that can be used in our systems when we look at the financial flows. So there is traction, there is hope, but again, it's, it's a long road and it's a long journey. I think what we've also found is that we've got great collaboration. Like I say, we meet on a weekly basis. We're engaging with the regulator. We're in engaging with certain departments as well, government departments, in trying to see how we can eradicate the slavery as well. Another positive, according to Marcel, is an effective law on South Africa's books called the Packetip Act, or the Prevention and Combating of Trafficking in Persons Act. It criminalizes trafficking and carries sentences of life imprisonment, a fine of up to 100 million rands, or both. It does a fabulous job and it's one of the few pieces of legislation in the world that also defines the concept of abuse of vulnerability where vulnerability is contextualized within the social context of South Africa and it speaks to those vulnerabilities that everyday South Africans face. We've got brilliant prosecutors 
who successfully employ that piece of legislation. And that's why we are seeing good successful prosecutions as well, all by it disproportionately disconnected from the number of cases that's reported to SAPS and that's on our our court rolls and, and not yet successfully prosecuted. And the perceptions out there, also data from civil society, it really tells us that this problem is vastly, vastly underestimated. While it's clear that there's legal, institutional and corporate infrastructure in place to take the fight to human trafficking, it's important to realise that every responsible citizen also has a vital role to play. We really need to look in our own backyard because this idea that, you know, these people who are hiring children and moving them around, you know, kind of in these sex rings, or these kind of deviants that float around on the periphery of society is untrue. There are people in our community. So this big case within the context of the senior council, he was a human rights activist. Very often there's an idea that the privileged have power and that power is associated with resources and money. They can hire better attorneys, they can do all kinds of fancy things and there's almost like this unimprisonable class. These are our next door neighbours you know, behind the high walls. We've got to call that out because, you know, we're calling out all these big institutions and traffickers and whatever. We need to call our own people out because it's people with money exploiting people without money. And that's what this is about. And it's happening in your neighborhoods. This is not something in kind of the dark recesses of the world that you don't see. This is happening everywhere. And people's kind of, it's not my business, I'm not saying anything, what if I get sued, all this kind of thing, not good enough. For Luke... Anyone can lend their personal power to help end trafficking. And all you need to do is speak up. Unless we kind of come up as a society and say no one can harm our children regardless of who you are, that's the first thing. And when we suspect, we have to come out. And we have to come out fighting and saying these are our children. If we don't stand up for our vulnerable, no one's going to. Thank you for listening to this episode of Investec Focus Radio's Future Impact. In our next episode... We look at the powerful role that export finance is playing in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and developing infrastructure in Africa. We only do projects that score very highly on the ESG objectives, whether it's healthcare or education, water projects, agricultural projects, roads. These are all things that enable the people on the continent. If you're not yet subscribed, You can find us by searching for Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, cheers from me, Sevenzini Gambule, and the Focus Radio team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Bank Limited, an authorized financial services provider and registered credit provider.